Well, good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to the adult Sunday school class, Believer's Chapel. I got to listen to Dr. Beal last week, uh, many, many, many miles away, uh, the clarity and listening to uh, into the lecture and uh, thought the amazing thing technology is that it was like I was right in the class. Uh, we're very, very blessed by the, uh, the things that God has allowed us to do. Here is uh, our study of Proverbs. This morning, Proverbs chapter 30, beginning in verse 18. This morning, uh, we are studying the wisdom of Agur, this wise man, and he is teaching us some things, and some things he leaves uh, just adrift in the air for us to ponder. So, beginning in verse 18, three things too wonderful for me, and for four I do not know this. So it's a uh, it's a style technique that he's using. It's three plus one. He's he describes it as three things, and then he adds one point, so we have four. Uh, verse 19, the way of an eagle in the sky, the way of a serpent on the rock, the way of a ship in the heart of the sea, the way of a man with a uh, maid, and we'll talk about that word. Uh, verse 20, this is the way of an adulteress, uh, she eats and wipes her mouth and says, I've done nothing wrong. 21, under three things the earth trembles, under four it cannot endure. Uh, 22, an official, that can be understood uh, as a slave or as a servant in the Old Testament, that word official. Becomes king, remember? Becomes is a transition word. It's not one, it's not two, it's between. So that helps us uh, with the force of what he wants us to consider. Becomes full of food. Uh, 23, under a hated woman when she gets married and a maidservant when she dispossesses her mistress. 24, and for four things, small creatures of the earth that are, and I'm going to uh, discuss this word with you, extremely wise. That's the uh, translation of the NIV. 25, uh, ants are without strength, though they store up their food in the harvest. And 26, the rock badger, are, and this is a, a difficult translation. I'm going to put down numerical strength. If you have something different, we'll talk about that in the exposition. Uh, and so here's the final purpose clause so that they place their houses in the rocks. Now, before we begin the exposition, I want to ask you to set a tab at Romans chapter 10 because I want to try to forcefully make a point from Paul's letter to the, uh, to the Romans uh, regarding these Proverbs this morning. So I will ask you to turn there to supplement our study. Well, here is our exposition this morning, beginning in verse 18. Uh, things, four ways Four things too wonderful for me. And the phrase literally is do not know them. And we know that that's the clear phrase because it's used in Proverbs chapter 29 and verse 7. The wicked person does not know. It's exactly the same uh, words, same construction. And here we have three without a list uh, with four to follow. 
So our wise man writes, there are three things too wonderful for me, and for four I do not know them. These are observations that he is making that appear to be extraordinary to him as he has observed the earth. The observation is that they are mysterious, which is interesting. We thought uh, with the skill of living and his ability to think and process that the wise man would unfold for us all mysteries. But he doesn't. He leaves them hanging in the air for us to ponder, and we can appreciate them that way. So let's discover them together. Here is verse 19. The first is an eagle in the sky uh, soaring on the air currents. It gives the impression that the bird is actually just gliding around. Um, then suddenly in its stealthfulness, it uh, goes into a fast and hard dive, spotting its prey. And if you've ever seen uh, a video of an eagle lifting a fish out of the water, it's amazing. It's breathtaking. How does the eagle see the fish? And yet he knows precisely and accurately where to dive and the speed of the fish and away it goes. That is a mystery to him. It was exciting for him to ponder it, to think about it. Um, see, it is his way. The, uh, it means the manner that the Lord God had made this creature, this bird, and his ability to get food for himself. He pondered that. He thought it was wonderful, mysterious. The eagle with its large wingspan seemingly defying gravity. You know, the largest of the birds in Palestine. Uh, God made aerodynamics. Uh, it was a wonder to behold the bird in the sky. But he knew nothing of aer aerodynamics. Uh, he was way behind the curve. Alan could give him a big, long lecture on the subject. He knew nothing about it. Yet, that was his mystery. Here's the second. The snake, over 30 species in that part of the world, only six are poisonous in that region. He observes its gliding movement over the rocks. Uh, it has no legs to give it any traction, and yet it moves along with great skill upon the flat rocks and the ledges. Nothing to hang on, nothing to cleave to, yet its movements are seemingly effortless. That was his amazement, mystery. Here's third. Line two, this way, this manner, this behavior. Now to me, this was a complete surprise. He leaves the creatures. You would think he would go to the creatures of the water, like uh, the, uh, the fish that seemingly uh, blitz across the, the seas or the lakes or ponds or whatever, and they just would move in an effortless fashion. But that's not what he's talking about. Here's what caught his attention. A boat. You thought he would have said something about the gliding fish, but no. It's a man-made boat that caught his attention. Look at this phrase, the heart of the sea. It refers to the open waters where the ships in their trade would travel. So this is not a ship near shore at all. This is way out in the dark, deep blue. 
And what do we see out there? Well, you have these enormous waves and the boat breaks and crashes through these waves. Caught his attention. The rocking motion back and forth across the sea. Almost defiant of the sea itself. Its currents. Its formidable winds that blow against it. It was a mystery to him. Here's one that we can all relate to. The fourth mysterious, almost mag uh, magnetic attraction of romantic relationships. Uh, in 1934, uh, Harvey Warren and Al Dubin penned a song. It was put on the silver screen in a movie, and it was sung by Dick Powell. And it went nowhere. But it was picked up by a wonderful group of black uh, artists, and they added a steel guitar and an opening riff, and it went in 1959 to number one. That group was called the Flamingos, and the song was, I Only Have Eyes for You. And that is exactly the mystery that our man is talking about. We've heard all the cliches, haven't we? Opposites attract. Um, uh, love at first sight. I didn't like him at first. But over time. Or we started off as friends. But then it grew from there. Uh, interestingly, um, Rebecca never laid eyes on her husband Isaac until the servant took him, took her to his tent. Imagine that. Um, and then all through the book of Genesis, you have this prohibition given by Abram and it's the servant. Put your hand underneath my thigh. Uh, Genesis 24. Don't pick a wife for my son Isaac uh, from the Canaanites. She has to be a family member. And you have this all the way through. This prohibition to not marry outside the family. It's what made uh, Esau's uh, Hittite wife so heinous and rebellious. Judah, the same, marrying a Canaanite daughter of Shua. And yet, it is mysterious in the fact that Pharaoh picked Joseph's wife. And God blessed that. Uh, we know that. Gave him two boys. Ephraim and Manasseh. And we know that uh, Joseph considered it the blessing of the Lord because he adds God's name to their names and describes the providence of both of the boys. It's amazing. So what do we learn from this mystery? Well, let's just look at this verse. Uh, you have this word, young girl, young maid. The word, word is actually a virgin. So it's the picture of love's relationship building here in the providence of God. It's the picture of uh, innocence as God in His providence would in time and place put two people together. Um, this word man tells us something. Uh, that is man in his strength. It's uh, used of Nimrod, Genesis chapter 10, and verse 8. So this is the young man who is strong and bold and brave, and that is his glory as he is a young man in his strength. That's the picture. And what our wise man says, it's all a mystery. We understand the mystery, 
by calling it the providence of God. Remember, God is the one that brought the woman to the man. He was the first down the aisle. You ever ask that trick question? Who was the first down the aisle? The Lord God. Here's verse 20. We open with this very important word, this or thus. Now, why would I say that that's very important? Well, it's important because it confirms the interpretation that we've used of the word way or ways. It has consistently been behavior, manner, and so we understand it to be universal. And this is the way of an adulteress. Now, we come from a virgin to the adulteress. He shocks us in our reading. A shopping, a shocking proverb. A married woman in a relationship outside of her marriage. The proverbs are clear. This person, this woman, can bring about great economic disaster, heartache, sadness inside the network of the family and the family relationship. So she is a danger and a danger sign. Here's what I tell young men all the time. You want to screw up your children? You really want to make a mess out of them? Go have an affair. That's the surefire way. I know by experience. I get the call. Come talk to my children. And they're a mess. They hate their father. And they despise their family and their family relationship. See, here's line two. Let's notice her behavior. She wipes her mouth. No physical trace on her. No. Matter of fact, she's improved herself. See the word eating? She has no lack. That's big in the ancient world, eating. The fool, he's going to make sure of that. She's going to be well fed. Why, he's going to open his wallet and he's going to spend all kinds of money on her. Next thing we know, she's driving the Mercedes convertible. She's got lots of jewelry, new clothes. That's the fool. That's his behavior. Last lesson, we talked about the autonomous man. And I gave you Webster's definition of autonomous, self-governing, independent, subject to its own laws. Now, Rauschus Rushduni, uh, that's a good Dutch name. Rauschus Rushduni wrote a book, and he has a wonderful title to the book. By what standard? Uh, the standard of your thinking the standard of your life. What's the standard? Now, that's why I wanted you to uh, set a tab at Romans chapter 10. I want to look at a couple of verses. You could quickly pass over these if you weren't methodically and carefully reading Romans. But the point is made quickly right here. Uh, the the Apostle Paul is describing the mind of the world. And so he begins by saying, they being ignorant of God's righteousness. Man does not have any idea of the demands of the righteousness of God. Period. His repentance deserves repentance. We've often heard that said. That is the idea of God's perfect righteousness. And so he says, they being ignorant of God's righteousness, look what he says, sought to establish their own. See that? And then he finishes it up by saying, they did not submit to God's righteousness. Uh, God's righteousness is Christ. Uh, that's the culmination of righteousness in itself. So what is this, verb, uh, this verse, two verses uh, that the Apostle Paul uses? What is he telling us? 
Man's blind. He doesn't understand righteousness. He doesn't really understand it. And, uh, of course, that opens the way of work salvation, the Roman Catholic Church, with big, broad doors. Oh, come in. We'll teach you righteousness. And what is it? Oh, it's Hail Marys. It's beads. It's candles. It's the Mass. It's this and that. Do this and do that and do this. You don't understand righteousness. Those things don't cleanse from sin. And you have men walking around in dresses or robes or whatever you want to call it, and they are filthy. Just like everybody else is filthy. They can't possibly be the means, call them father, call them priest. They can't possibly be the means, the bridge between you and God. They're just common, ordinary men. That's what the Bible teaches. We are all the same. Every one of us. We have different gifts, and we use those in the body of Christ, but we are all the same. We're all beggars in need of great mercy. Now here's her words. Here's her voice crafted in space and time for all eternity. I've done nothing wrong. <laughs> Amazing. Here's Matthew chapter 12 and verse 36. The Lord said, I tell you that men will give an account on the day of judgment for every careless word that they have spoken. The quote gives us an insight into the darkness of her mind, heart. Let's just analyze it together for a moment. See the eye? That's the autonomous man. That's the self here. Giving an account to self of her own way. I'm not so bad. You know, here's... Here's a horrible criminal, a murderer. I'm not so bad. I'm not so bad. We're all condemned. Don't you understand? Uh, Robert Dabney said we're all in different stages and forms of putrefaction, but we're all dead. Dead in trespasses and sins. Uh, look at that word, done. What is that? That's the conscience that's been seared as with a hot iron. There's no hope for a conscience like that. None whatsoever. Paul says, 1 Timothy 5, 6, that such women, even though they are still alive, are dead already. That's man. He's walking around, but he's dead. That's why he needs to be born again. He needs to be saved from above. He needs to cry out, God, save me. And that'll be a prayer that will be answered. She doesn't see any need. She's happy and content. And the man that she is with is a fool. That's the proverb. 21 through 23 is a separate unit altogether with a different theme, Mar uh, making uh, observations of an upside-down world. Okay, what is an upside-down world? He's going to explain it to us. Under three things, the earth trembles. Under four, it cannot endure. So it's three plus one again, his style. And that opening is the title line for this new separate section. The word earth, it's a figure representing the social order, the culture, a people, a nation, the society of the world. So it is disturbed. See the word tremble? And the word endure meaning to bear up under. Think of it this way. 
Here we have a table, and we're going to put a large weight on that table. And another, and another, and another. And then we notice that the legs are beginning to tremble. And we hear the crack of wood. It is bearing up, but this weight is pressing down upon the object. That is the picture of the shaking before the total and complete collapse under the weight. So, for our wise man, we ask, who is the weight? Who is providing the weight that's cracking the table? And his answer, the scoundrels and the scamps of the world. Here's the first, verse 22. An official. That word is used for a slave or a servant. One who is subordinate, but somehow, some way, becomes a king. We know anybody like that? I think we do. I think we do uh, in our day and time. You ever heard of Saddam Hussein? Started off uh, as a, in poverty, uh, hungry all the time, learned to fight his way on the streets, and for that he was thrown into prison, got out of prison, and he joined the Bath Party, and he started fighting again fighting his way to the top. And he got to be king. He got to be the ruler. And look the horror that he did to that country. That's who he is, Saddam Hussein. It's an atrocity, says our wise man. We now have a fool, we have an incompetent as a ruler over us. Solomon, Ecclesiastes 10, 5, and 6. There's an evil under the sun, an error that proceeds from a ruler. Fools are put in high places. Oh, man, aren't we glad we skipped that in America. <laughs> Line 2. And a fool when he becomes full of food. Now, there's become. See, we're transitioning. It's not one it's not two, it's between. So there was a time when he wasn't full. Now he is full. And he is an individual in abundance. And look at him. He has a reckless life. He turns the world upside down. A la Adolf Hitler. And we witness it. We witness it every day in our culture, in our society. These complete fools who believe that they're the end-all and the be-all to everything. Whatever phase it's in, they're obnoxious and it's horrible. Verse 23, this tops the turvy world moves into the home in domestic relations. Under a hated, the idea of hated here is that one can no longer endure the relationship. Rather than vehement vitriol, when she becomes married and a maidservant, when she dispossesses her mistress. So this is a statement of intolerance, and it is between two females. Let's examine this. The first the woman who is understood to be intolerable. And what happens? Well, she finally gets a husband, which makes her a leader, a person of note or notoriety in the Jewish home. But she can't rule herself. Now she's ruling a family, and it's a disaster. We see it all the time, don't we? Uh, Put in a position of power, and she is a mess. Here's another, a second example. The maidservant who dispossesses, 
the word central idea is a legal succession, she takes possession of the home. Now, we have an example of that in the Bible? Well, we sure do. How about Genesis chapter 16? How about Hagar? And in rebellion, she shot, sought to dispossess her mistress and take over the family because she could get pregnant and Sarai couldn't. So she thought that that made her superior. How wrong she was. That term, by the way, mistress, that is an honorary title in the Bible. It is used of royalty at court. 1 Kings chapter 11 and verse 19. Now the final two Proverbs this morning from observation. Small creatures of the earth that are extremely wise. Wise, we really see the God-given skill that He gives these creatures. God-given enablement to survive, to succeed, to secure, to prevail and prosper. We have heard the moral brain over brawn. Well, here it is in full display. These tiny creatures of God actually succeed. And that's what was amazing for him to observe. So let's pay attention again to the style. Previously, we had a list of three plus one, but here it's just a list of four. Straightforward. Small. Don't leave that word. It's full of thought for us. Why? Well, we've got, the, we've got all the telescopes out there, and they're showing the vastness of the creation, and we're all wowed by it. But uh, what's the crown of the creation according to the Scriptures? It's man. Man's greater than all of that. Man's greater than the greatest star that we've ever been able to see. God said, this is the epitome of all the created order. It's man. What is man doing here? Look at that word again, small. What's he doing? Man, the crown of creation, has to bend down low to learn wisdom from a tiny creature. That is your depravity. That's the word small. You have to think through these words carefully. From these creatures, we're going to learn wisdom. The very idea is a commentary on our depravity. Now, they're small, meaning they're limited. They're disadvantaged by the Creator of all things. You see that but? That's a contrast. That should be red circled, highlighted, because that is going to be something very important for us to learn. Here it is. We receive surprising instruction from these tiny creatures. Wisdom, skill, masterful, God-given cunning from the tiniest of things as they actually survive, thrive, prosper. That's their existence. Look at what he uses to describe this. Very wise. That's your translation in the NIV. Psalm 64 and verse 6. That's your verb. The wicked plot out injustice, says the psalmist, how? Well, here's your verb. With a very well-thought, well-executed plan. We just had a hundred million dollars worth of jewels stolen away. They have no leads. They have no traces in Europe. It was a very well-thought, well-executed, perfect plan. That's what the psalmist is saying. That's the verb. So let's learn. Here's our first. We studied it together 
Proverbs chapter 6, the ant, severe limitation. Look, he has no strength, no physical force, no self-defense. Why? We just step on ants, don't we? And yet they survive, they thrive, storing their food in the harvest, which is an exceptional achievement that serves as an excellent role model for us. Okay, here's their prudence. By planning ahead, thinking through in advance, that's what they do. Then they're never caught off guard by anything. We've always heard, oh, we have a contingency for that. Oh, we have a plan for that. That's the ant. You know the rich fool? The one who tore down his barns to build bigger barns? He had no contingency plan. He was all caught up in his work. God took his life. He's a fool. No plan B. He was too tied up with himself and his work in this life. No wisdom there. But this ant, look at him. He's always preparing for tomorrow. Here's what I learned from the ant. And I've tried to apply it. If I will do tomorrow's work today, today, I'll never be behind. Never. That's the end. That's what he taught me. Here's 26. Rock badgers, a people without numerical strength. The rock badger is yellow and brown. He blends into the rocks near the Dead Sea in the valley of Israel's Mount Hermon. And there is disagreement among the scholars whether this term is without strength like the ant or without numbers. No one is consistent about either one of those translations. I think we can all agree on this. He is created by God to be a loner. He doesn't move in groups in His habitat. Not like a, a, a group of monkeys in a tree. No, He's all by Himself. And God created Him that way. So here's what's clear. Here's the wisdom. Where they build their refuge. Wise in that this small creature thinks in terms of his security at all times. And that was what the father was teaching his son. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 26. Make level paths for your feet, and all your ways will be secure. So, in wisdom, the skill, the rock badger, puts himself in a difficult place for his enemies to reach. Now, now that we're in the proverb, we've got a great illustration. The city of Jerusalem. David is now the king. He's been made king by all Israel. And David looks up and he sees Jerusalem on a high mountain and he says, that's going to be my city. That's going to be my fortress. Jerusalem. There are only one problem. The Jebusites live there. Who were they? The Jebusites, well, they're one of the tributary clans that came from the Canaanites. So what does that mean? It means they're dead already. God has already condemned them as a people. That's what that means. And what did the Jebusites say to David as he's massing his forces down in the valley and they're looking up and the Jebusites are looking down? Here's what they said. 2 Samuel chapter 5, verse 6. You cannot come in here by the blame, the blind and the lame will ward you off. In other words, our security, our, our surroundings... This city will keep anybody out. Don't you understand? <laughs> That's part of your lesson. You trust in things of the world and they will disappoint you. They always will. They will always at some point in time fail because your trust has been in things. 
How do you secure victory consistently at all times? By trusting in the Lord. You trust in Him. So here's what George Mueller taught us. He said, you remain in neutral about all things until God makes it clear to you what His will and plan is. And it will come to you in many confirming ways. And when it does, you say, that is God's will for me. Okay, here's the rub. All hell's going to break loose on you. Through many dangers, toils, and snares we have already come. What was the Apostle Paul? He was going to take the Gospel to the world. And what happened? Stoned, shipwrecked, left in the sea, naked, hungry, beaten with rods, beaten with whips. That's the opposition. Follow the Word of God as He has given you clear indication and you don't deviate from it. That's why my favorite all-time great quote from Charles Spurgeon. If God has a purpose to serve by a man, that man will live out his days and accomplish, that's the key word, accomplish the divine design. The more resistance he experiences, the more certain will his life work be achieved. My friends, when you determine the will of God for your life, don't you deviate from it. Don't you let anything detract you from it. You walk it and expect nothing but resistance. But if you stay on the path, you will win. And that's what the Apostle Paul took us. So, in this, looking at this final proverb, I, it provoked a lot of questions for me, and I think that they're applicable to you. I want to ask this question, because the Rock Badger is all about security. Oh, well, we're all about security. That's why we buy insurance, right? We're all about security. So, here's the question. What is the safest place 24-7, 365, what's the safest place in the entire planet? Where is it? Well, remember, I've used this many times before. Remember Peter on that boat? Lord, if that's you, bid me to come. You notice nobody else jumped in. And, and bid me to come too. No. What did we learn by that incident? Peter out there, away from the boat. He's walking on the water. The winds and the waves are going and thrashing. Who was in the safest place? The men with timber underneath their feet? No. The safest place was where the Lord was. My friends, the safest place on the planet is to be for you wherever the Lord is. And Peter proved it to us, didn't he? Because the winds and the waves came. He got distracted. He began to sink. And what did he find out? Lord, save me. Whoop! Right out of the water. Your God can handle whatever the circumstances, providence, or experience that you're going through. He can handle it if you stay close to Him. So what does that tell me about Peter being so foolish to get out of that boat? You've got to be crazy out here in the wind and the waves and it's dark. No, Peter chose the best. He chose the secure place and the secure place was wherever the Lord is. The proximity. They're walking back to the boat together. And Peter is with the Lord, and they were a distance away. Peter chose better. 
What is the safest place on the planet? Every day of your life, be close to the Lord. That's the safest place. You have dangers? Don't we all? You have maladies? Don't we all? You have difficulties? Don't we all? You have addictions? Don't we all? Don't we have many dangers? Yes, that's part of it. Stay close to the Lord and you win. And you get there. And as Spurgeon said, the more resistance that one experiences, the more certain will his life work be achieved. Finally, what does the book of Proverbs teach you and me about security? It does, you know. Very clearly. You ought to know it instantly. It ought to be on the tip of your tongue. Here is security from the book of Proverbs. The book of wisdom from God. 18.10. You don't need to turn there. You should know it. Backwards, forwards, sideways. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run to it and are safe. In a difficult place, in a challenging place right now, you feel everything trembling because of the weight of whatever's pressing down upon you? Well, here's the answer. You be where the Lord is. You keep Him close. You don't let anything sever that relationship with Him. Moment by moment, day by day, and the rest of it, my friends, is a short putt. It's a short putt. You're in the safest place on the planet. And you can't breathe. And they say it's a matter of hours, maybe minutes, your organs are shutting down. And you smile. You smile. You're with the Lord. And that's the safest place all times. Let's pray. Thank You, Father, for our time of study this morning. Bless these, Your people, with the power of Your Word to transform our lives day by day, minute by minute, to be conformed to the image of Your Son. Lord, faith comes by hearing. Hearing comes from the Word of God. We have heard the Word of God. Give us the faith that we need to walk Your walk. And we will praise You and live to Your glory from that point forward. In Christ's name, Amen.